Hey everybody, welcome back to the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. I'm your host, Gordo Gambles. Welcome back to another full card breakdown. This time for UFC Vegas 70, we got ourselves a nice main event. Light heavyweight, Nikita Krylov versus Ryan Spann. Coming off that UFC Vegas 69 card, which honestly was a lot of fun until William Knight decided to pack up his bags and stand there and throw eight strikes over 15 minutes. So uh, it was a decent card overall. I think I was uh, way too under-owned to Felipe Lynn, so I didn't take down any real money in DFS, but good betting night. Went four and one. Would have had a sweep if it wasn't for a Jessica Andrade, but Aaron Blanchard looked great. That's enough about last week. Let's move on to this one. Quickly, before I do though, as you guys know, not usual setup. Uh, a bit of a hectic week for me. So if this video is a bit, you know what, poorly edited or you don't feel like you've got enough of a, a grasp of what I'm trying to say, feel free to comment down below, DM me on Twitter. I'll be sure to explain everything I can. I apologize for the hecticness of this video. Hopefully it gets my point across okay though, because we do have a fun card and I'm excited to get into it. First fight of the night, we have Jose Johnson 15 and 7, Garrett Armfield 8 and 3. This is a fun fight at 135. Jose Johnson is a huge bantamweight here. He's a guy who is going to be a lot bigger physically. I think he's going to have the better striking advantage here against a guy in Garrett Armfield who did have a tough UFC debut in David Onama. Garrett Armfield 8 and 3, a guy who has seen to have certain weaknesses, whether it be with his submission defense, with a few things, but he is a solid wrestler and he's going to have to utilize that if he wants to win this fight. Jose Johnson, although he is a powerful striker with decent getup game, huge hole in his game is that takedown defense. He's able to be taken down, he's able to be controlled, and if Garrett Armfield wants to win minutes, he can do that very well because on the feet, it's going to be hard for Armfield to get around that that power and that range that Jose Johnson does have with a huge frame at this weight division. However, by shooting those takedown, Garrett Armfield kind of puts himself in questionable positions. Jose Johnson does like to have a not only decent power, but a decent offensive grappling game. It, it could be one where we're looking to showcase violence in this very first fight of the night. That's not a spot I like too much, but when it comes to taking a side, I think Garrett Armfield has more minute winning potential with the takedowns, the wrestling, the control time. Jose Johnson has more finish potential with the ability to catch Armfield in something or that insane power he does have that weight division. Either way, decent DraftKings target. I think Jose Johnson at the price tag of 7.7 does have some good finish upside because we have seen him with some great elbows, decent getup game. And, and you know what? That decent getup game will also translate to some takedown points for someone like Garrett Armfield. Either way, this does have an opportunity to score well for both fighters this week. Next up, 7-2 Haley Cohen versus 7-2 Aline Perez. Aline Perez has all the confidence in the world. Just check out her Twitter. And Haley Cohen's, you know what? Someone who's new to the UFC, making her debut. She is a beast. She is a huge fighter. This 135 pound division. She is a former gymnast and it shows she's very physically imposing. She likes to use that brute strength to bully her opponents in the clinch. And she's someone who's going to have ability to win minutes in the clinch here and also have the decent striking game to back. The big hole in the game for Haley Cohen, although she is super strong and hard to take down, is she's a fish out of the water on the mat, in my opinion. She's been submitted before. She has not the best submission defense. And she's ability not only to be dominated on the mat, but also submitted. And that's kind of not the the game, the recipe you want for Aline Perez. Aline Perez is someone who is mostly ground game dependent. I know she struggled against those judo throws of Stephanie Egger, but I'd have Z Stephanie Egger about minus 300 over Haley Cohen here. So I think Alan Perez is someone who's going to have the ability to take advantage of the weaknesses of Haley Cohen, whether that be through the submission defense that Haley Cohen doesn't really seem to have some good takedowns and some top control from William Perez. And is she someone who I think has more DraftKings potential at 7.6K? However, if we're looking at this fight from a minute winning potential, this fight's on the feet. Haley Cohen might have the harder shots. She might have the ability to win on the judges scorecards. And for that reason, it's kind of tempting. But the X factor is that ground game. And I do think Alan Perez has a decent enough aggression and ability to take it to the ground in order to score points in that area. Aline Perez at $7,600. She does have the submission path to victory, which by the way, plus a thousand submission. I think that line's a bit wide. I did sprinkle that myself, but I am picking Ellen, Ellen Perez here to win because I do think she has the ability to take advantage of those holes in Hailey Cohen's game. Let's call it a round two submission, which would score very well at that 7.6k price tag. Next up, the 8-0 Narulo Aliyev versus the 2011 Rafael Alves. Now, this is a very, very fun fight. Rafael Alves is known to break down around the cage, a guy who's just super explosive, super dynamic, but he has been finished a lot. He's getting this prospect who just cruised and dominated on the contender series he's not usually a finisher but he absolutely finished that guy early on great elbows great top control he's a typical wrestler he's a good ability to get it to the ground control people there and, and brutalize them when they're on the mat like i said not the best finisher but against a guy in rafael alves who has been finishing a lot of his losses you have to think the under might be a good play here because rafael alves is a guy who's super dynamic round one just great power good submission game just ask mark Pierre casey and it, it's a really fun type of fighter because he either goes out there around one really explosive or tends to fade down the stretch. And I think that if you're fading down the stretch against someone like Aliyev, it's not going to be pretty. I think Alves is round one or bust because if he's not able to get Aliyev out of there, Aliyev's going to take over with his cardio, his durability, his ground control, and just his ability to wear people down down the stretch. I think both these guys are competent drafting plays because Aliyev's path to victory is takedowns, control time, and a, a good scoring drafting recipe. 
and Alvis is round one or bust. So if Alvis is going to win this at his 7.4k salary, I do think it scores very well. I don't mind violence here as well. I know I've talked about violence in the first three fights, but Alvis is a guy who typically likes to exemplify violence here. So give me Ali up to win this fight, although you have to be wary of the dangers of Rafael Alves early on. Next up, we have the second biggest favorite on the card, Joe Selecki, 12-3, and three, facing short notice replacement Carl Deaton the third. We love a good third of his name, but we do not love his haircut, man. What's going on with that? I, I know we talk about haircuts. We'll talk about them in a bit in Charles Johnson, but what a topology picture. And you do the research, and this guy just kind of exemplifies that haircut. And he, he's pretty wild. He's pretty durable. He's pretty tough. But he's getting a huge step up in competition against Joe Selecki, a guy who, a guy who's supposed to be facing Benoit Saint Denis, a guy who's been in the division for a while, a guy who's just an insane grappler. And although I talked about Carl Deaton being tough, he's not a world beater. He's going to be a huge step down for Selecki. And although I think that Carl Deaton may be able to fight better than that price tag entails, Selecki is a rightful favorite. He's the guy who the UFC wants to win. He does have more paths of victory here. I think Joe Selecki is a decent GPP target because again, that first round summation is always there. But I'm not liking him as much as other targets. And I, I think that I'm kind of going to be under-owned to Joe Selecki because I do think Carl Deaton is pretty tough. And although Joe Selecki is a guy who has got a great submission game, everyone talk about how great he is on the ground, he gets chin-checked. He's not the smartest fighter sometimes. I don't know how good his, gra his wrestling is, although his grappling is great. I think Carl Deaton could pose problems to win this fight, but at the end of the day, Joe Selecki is going to win it a lot of the time. Not much value on either side, in my opinion. I think Joe Selecki gets it done eventually, but I don't know how well it scores in the process. So um, give me Joe Selecki to win. Um, but it might, it might be dicey. Next up, Odie Osborne, 11 and five, Charles Johnson, 13 and three, Charles Johnson, that haircut, hopefully it's gone by now, but Odie Osborne's a guy I like. He, he's kind of hit or miss though. I mean, he's been knocked out by Tyson Nams. He's great performances against other fighters in this division, but he, he's all over the place. And he's a guy who I think has a great dynamic skill set, a guy who could pose problems for a lot of people here, but I think he's getting one of the worst matchups he could because Odie Osborne's a guy who likes to go out there, be super dynamic early on. And if he can't get the finish, he fades down the stretch while Charles Johnson's the opposite. Charles Johnson is super durable, super tough. He has the ability to go out there and fight for all 15 minutes, and he kind of builds as the fight goes on. And if you're going to be there in that second and third round when Odie Osborne is tiring, you're going to have the ability to win those second and third rounds. So I think Charles Johnson wins this fight a lot of the time just because Odie Osborne doesn't have the ability to keep up with someone Charles Johnson. Although I do like the skill set, the range, the offensive grappling, the offensive striking of Odie Osborne, he has holes in his game, not only that cardio, but his striking defense unfortunately, as much as I want to cheer for Odie Osborne, I don't think he has the offensive output as well as the ability to keep up that pace for a lot of the time to beat someone Charles Johnson. Therefore, I think Charles Johnson wins this fight a lot of the time on the judges' scorecards. At 9K, though, Charles Johnson, not a fighter I want, mostly a decision fighter, doesn't have any takedown equity. He's almost a complete fade for me at 9K. I almost like Odie Osborne more on drafting due to that finishing upside, although I don't think he's going to get it a lot of the time. Next up, 10-2, and two, Jordan Monkey King leave it versus 13-4, and four, Victor Martinez. Monkey King coming off a loss to Patty the Batty Pimblet, where he put up a good account of himself. The guy is a primary grappler, and guess what? He's facing a primary striker in Victor Martinez, striker versus grappler matchup. Give me the grapple. And I say that a lot of the time, and it, it, hear me out for a second, because Jordan Leva is not a guy you want to have your hard-earned money on. I get it. But Victor Martinez is a guy who can be taken down. I think he's a fish out of the water on the mat. I think he's a guy who puts himself in a lot of horrible position. If you're doing that against Monkey King, a guy who we know will wrestle proactively and is really good on the ground, it's dangerous. On the feet, there's no question. Victor Martinez is going to have a huge advantage, not only with the output, but also with the technical ability. Jordan Leva shells up, though. He, he's pretty good defensively. He doesn't allow himself to absorb that much damage. And he's a smart guy. He's a guy who's able to, to follow his game plan. He knows exactly what he has to do to get it done. And in this case, he has to take down Victor Martinez and let Martinez make a mistake, which he does very often. I think Leva's going to shoot early. He's going to shoot often. I think he has a decent wrestling game. And as soon as Victor Martinez is feeling that pressure on the ground, I think it's going to leave a lot of opportunities for Leva to find that neck, to find a mistake that Martinez is making. And I do think he has good finishing upside. On DraftKings at 8K, I think he's a fighter you want to have ownership of because his path to victory includes takedowns, submissions, control time. And I do think he's able to get in Victor Martinez, a guy who can be taken down, a guy who can be finished on the mat. On the flip side, 8.2 for Martinez. Do I expect him to get Jordan Leavitt out of there? It's it's a possibility. Leavitt hat can fade down the stretch, but I don't think it's going to be an easy task. Leave it is usually pretty durable on the feet. He's able to withstand some damage and leave it knows what he wants to do. He's going to have to wrestle. So I'm more inclined to leave it side. I think his submission is what I'm going to be protecting here because of those holes where Martinez leaves. Give me another dog shot on Jordan Leave it. Next up, the 8-1 Gabriela Fernandez, the 7-2 Jasmine Jazz Vicious Fernandez coming here on short notice facing the Canadian prospect here who is a primary grappler again. We talk about the grappler. She has good top control. She's lanky. And this kind of feels like another striker versus grappler matchup because Fernandez is probably going to have the advantage on the feet. She has good volume. She has good range, good technical ability. And Jasmine was just pieced up by someone who was able to keep her at range, stop those takedowns. 
The problem is I don't think Fernandez has that same ability to stop the takedowns. I think Jasmine is a girl who knows what she has to do. She's good at doing it. She's a good wrestler, in my opinion. She's going to have the ability to control Fernandez and eliminate that technical striking that Fernandez does have. You add in the fact that Fernandez is coming on short notice, taking a step up in competition, potentially a step down in competition for Jasmine. I think Jasmine should be the favorite here. 7.8K, does she have the most drafting upside? Probably not, because her path to victory is most likely a decision. She scored 85 against Hanson, so it could be a, a good cash play here if you're looking for someone who can wrestle, who can score well, and will probably go all 15 minutes. But maybe a betting side of things. I know I've talked about betting Jordan Levin and Alan Perez, so do I want to trust Jasmine Dazavistas as well? Maybe not, but I, I do think she has good takedown potential. She should win this fight a lot of the time. Um, but she's going to have to shoot takedowns to get it there, and I trust she will because on the feet, Fernandez is no joke. Give me Jasmine, though. Give me a three-round decision due to takedowns and top control. Next up, moving on to the six-fight main card. Before we do so, hit the like button down below. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, this next one's going to be fun. Eric Gonzalez, 14-7. and seven. Trevor Peak, 7-0. and oh, Coming off the Dana White Contender Series. And this is going to be fun as long as it lasts. Because these guys have no regard for their own safety. Like These guys go out there, balls to the wall. Trevor Peak is a guy with, with no defensive reliability at all. He just wants to get his opponents out of there. He can get hit a lot. He can be taken down. He's a madman. And respects to him he's got great power he knows that but one day it's gonna get him caught but is eric gonzalez the type of guy to make him pay probably not because gonzalez is also similar he likes to go out there throw complete haymakers he has been finished he's got that killer to be killed style and although I, trevor peak's not a guy who i want to rely on because i don't like his, his his no defense style he will have the ability to put out eric gonzalez the same way jim miller was able to here in my opinion so this fight's gonna be all hectic it's one you're gonna probably need ownership on DraftKings. i think if eric gonzalez wants to win this fight he can probably take down and, and mount someone like Trevor Peak or try to catch him on those sloppy uh, exchanges. But either way, it's so much of a firefight. I don't know how much of a prediction I want to have on this. I think if you're looking at it being a firefight for as long as it lasts, Trevor Peak's probably going to have more durability. And for that reason, I'm going to have to pick him to win. Either way, great drafting potential for both sides. I would play the under, but it's already juiced. It's a really, really fun fight. Speaking of fun fights, though, 8-1-1, one, one, Mike Malott, 9-1, Johan Le Ness. This is what you guys are all waiting for. Gordo Gambles, the Canadian himself, talking about the two Canadians fight and tweeted out a couple things earlier in the week. Canadian hasn't won since September 2022. It's a few months now. And uh, when the one Canadian 2023 fought, it was a draw. Canadians have a 100% draw rate in 2023. How great is that? But it looks like Canada might finally get a win. Woohoo! Go Canada. The state of Canadian MMA has never looked stronger. Uh, but this is going to be a fun fight for as long as it lasts. Same thing here. Mike Malott, 8 1 1, has only gone out of the second round once. Johan Lainess, 9 1. If we look past that Darian Week showing where he did win the fight, but landed what 30 something strikes he is a guy who's typically killer to be killed as well this to me has violence written all over it because mike malott is a great technical striker he has a great ability to mix it up he's very well rounded good wrestling good submissions good striking but he leaves holes defensively and johan Lennes is the opposite he is a guy who goes out there balls to the wall again except for this week's fight and throws haymakers and if he lands he's probably gonna put out mike malott but it's so funny because Mike Malott is a thousand times better technically. Johan Ness is a guy who is kind of like Trevor Peak. He's balls to the wall. He's okay to be hit. He's got great power and he knows it. And for that reason, although I am picking Mike Malott to win, you have to be wary of the power that Johan Ness has because Mike Malott was rocked. He can be touched, can be hit, but I think Mike Malott's the much better fighter wherever this fight goes. 9.2K, I think he has the ability to get it done round one, whether it be on the ground or the submission game, whether it be on the feet technically wearing down and breaking someone in Johan Lainess who was broken by someone in Gabe Green. I think he has great potential in the spot. Scored 111 last time. I think he can replicate that here. It, it should be a fun fight for as long as it lasts, but give me the more well-rounded fighter, better technical fighter in Mike Malott. Next up, the return of Tatiana Suarez, one we've been waiting for for over three years now. This is going to be a really, really fun fight. Shorter breakdown, though, because... We know Tatiana Suarez. It's pretty simple. If she is the same fighter of old, she will dominate Montana De La Rosa. No question about that. Tatiana Suarez averages 119 DraftKings points per fight. The girl's an absolute beast. She put up 156 against Esparza. She has the ability to be slate breaking and she is a great fighter 9.6K and the, the price tag justifies that. The only question we have is, is she still the same Tatiana Suarez? Is she able to withstand the same amount of pressure? Is she able to fight the same way that she was three years ago? Because if she is, this should be an absolute blowout. Although we don't know where she's been. So give me Tatiana Suarez, no hot take here. I think she's able to take down, control, dominate, and finish Montana De La Rosa unless there's just some huge lack in training, although I completely doubt that. Tatiana Suarez should roll here. Now we get to the big boys, 265, Dontel Mays, Augusto Sakai. Dontel Mays broke our hearts against Hamdi, the drugged up Abdelawab. Augusto Sakai has been also on a downward spiral, losing and being knocked out to a bunch of guys. So who do you take? Who's a lesser of two evils? It, it's tough because Sakai is probably the better technical striker. I know he's a better technical striker, has a lot of power and has fought better level of competition. 
but not only has he been knocked out, but he can be taken down, control, and dominated. And we've seen Dontel Mays shoot takedowns. We've seen him dominate people like Josh Parisian, but he also shot takedowns against someone in Hamdi who you shouldn't be shooting takedowns against. It's just kind of in his nature now. D1 Dontel Mays is there, and if I think if he shows up, he could beat Augusta Sakai. With that being said, though, in a 15-minute striking exchange, I will have to favor Augusta Sakai. I just don't think that happens. I'm actually going to pick Dante Mays to win this fight. I think he has grappling upside here. I think that at 7.9K, he has the ability to replicate his 124-point performance like he did against Joss Parisian, although it will be a step up in competition. You have to be wary of the power and technical ability Sakai has in the feet. I just think whoever has the more DraftKings upside, who has more paths to win this fight is Dante Mays, and I, I would not be surprised if he goes there. Not one I'm super confident in, but I, I, I am picking Dante Mays to win the fight. Next up, 23 and four, Andre Muniz, 20 and five, Brendan Allen. Andre Muniz is a killer, great ground game. He's got the ability to snap people's arms a few times, great arm bar series. The, guy, the guy's a killer, he's a beast, but he's not the best minute winner. He's not the best striker, he doesn't have the best cardio. He is pretty much a submission or bust guy early on and against a guy in Brendan Allen. Is he able to submit Brendan Allen? That's the question, and I think he is. Don't get me wrong, I think he is. But if he doesn't, it leaves a lot of questions because Brendan Allen has good striking, much better cardio. He has the ability to keep up on the ground. I don't get the price tag too much. I think Andre Muniz should be favored because he should win this fight a lot of the time. But what happens if he doesn't get to submit him round one? What happens if this fight starts round two in the feet and Muniz is tired? Allen is going to be the better striker. He's going to have the ability to piece up someone Andre Muniz who doesn't offer much on the feet. And if he stops those takedowns, he could win. Again, let me backtrack. I think Andre Manu should be the favorite. I think he does have good DraftKings potential, good ceiling, but I think Brendan Allen is kind of going overlooked at 7.1K. I mean, he could probably finish Muniz with volume in the end of the third round if he tires out. It's a really tricky one for me to call. I want to stay away from it from a betting perspective, but this fight does have good GBB potential, whether it be early on with Muniz, later on with Allen. It's a fun fight. Excited to hear your thoughts on it, but this is one I couldn't really put my foot down on. I think there's a value on Allen, however. I do think Muniz should be the favorite here, just maybe not so wide. And last but not least, the main event, Nikita Krylov, 29 and nine, Ryan Span 21 and seven, all violence here. With these guys shot out of cannon early on, they have great finished potential. Guys who I think have a lot of holes in their game, but in this case, someone's gotta prevail. And who do I think is the more, who do I think has more paths of victory here? It's Nikita Krylov. He has that takedown game. He has the ability to win minutes. I think he has great power on the feet as well. And I think he has the paths of victory or the style that's gonna cause problems for Ryan Span. Takedowns top pressure submissions, and also ground and pound. However, the big question is, Ryan Spann's guillotine has burned me before. Just ask the unquick lava. Ryan Spann has the ability to pull these wins out of his behind and, and, and come through in times where no one expects him to. So although Nikita Krylov should be the favorite here, I think he should win this fight. You have to be wary of that Ryan Spann guillotine. You have to be wary of that power that Ryan Spann has. And it's a fight you got to target on DraftKings. Total set at one and a half, and it's juiced towards the under. For that reason, I'm going to be all over this fight. Span at 7.5 has good DraftKings potential because his path to victory is probably catching Krylov early. And if he does so, he scored 91, 100 points. At 7.5, he will be optimal. I think Krylov wins this fight a lot more of the time. He has good upside here with his takedowns, top control pressure, volume, finishing ability, because I do think this fight finishes. And I do think at 8.7, he's a guy you're going to want to have as well. Either way, fun, violent affair. Wouldn't mind parlaying the under with that, with the under in the peak fight. So much violent spots and violence has burned me the past couple weeks. So we're going to be careful how I pick my spots here. But that's going to do it for me here on the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. Before I go, let me give you my quick picks real quick. Again, all these gun to my head. Who do I have to pick? I'm taking Nikita Krylov. We're taking Andre Muniz. We're taking Dontel Mays, as ugly as that sounds. Tatiana Suarez, Mike Malott, Trevor Peak, Jasmine Jazdavicious, Jordan Leavitt, Charles Johnson, Joe Selecki, Narulo Aliyev, Alin Perez, and this is a, this is a toss up, Garrett Armfield with more minute winning potential. Either way, fun fight on DraftKings. If you look at underdogs, I like Perez. I like the round one potential of Spain. You're gonna want a lot of that main event ownership. You're gonna want a lot of Elaine S. Malat ownership. I think Mays, Leavitt, Jazz Devicious, and Perez are all sneaky underdogs. I think up top, try to get to score as much as you can, although it is hard. Malat's a great target. Peak, Aliyev, Krilov. Such a fun card. Lots of options, lots of things I just sprout out there. So again, if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section down below. DM me on Twitter. DMs are always open at Gambles Gordo. Feel free to message me there. A lot of content, a lot of information. So hopefully you guys are able to grasp how I'm targeting this drafting slate because it is a fun one. So with that being said, hit the like button down below, subscribe to the channel. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video and are looking forward to another violent affair. Next week's a big one. So make sure you're subscribed here and uh, come back for that one because it should be fun. Should be back to our normally well-edited videos. But until then, guys, enjoy the fights and let's make some money, guys.